Welcome to episode 108 of Gods and Heroes of Ancient Greece. My name is Mylinda Butterworth, and today we continue with the tales of Troy and the story of the funeral games for Achilles. In Troy, too, they were doing honor to a slain hero, Glaucus the Glycaean, the loyal ally of the Trojans, had fallen in the last struggle with the Argives, and his body, which his friends had snatched from the hands of his foes, was burned and buried. The following day, Diomedes, son of Tydeus, rose in the Argive assembly and proposed that at once, at the very moment when their enemies were rallying their courage because Achilles was dead, that they must attack the city with chariots and foot soldiers and storm the walls. But Ajax, son of Telamon, opposed him. It would not be right, he said, to offend the goddess of the sea, who was mourning her son. Should we not before all things have splendid funeral games for glorious Achilles? Yesterday, when Theta sank back into the waves, she begged me not to leave her son unhonored, and declared that she herself would reappear at the celebrations. As for the Trojans, even though the son of Peleus has fallen, it is unlikely that they will marshal sufficient courage to resume the fight as long as you, Diomedes, and I, and Agamemnon, son of Atreus, are among the living. I shall well agree with you, provided Thetis really comes today, Diomedes replied. Her wish must take precedence over the demands of war. As the last words left his lips, the waves parted, and the wife of Peleus, frail as the breath of dawn, rose from the sea and advanced towards the Argives. With her came the nymphs, her handmaids, and from the veils which floated about them they drew magnificent prizes and spread them out before the eyes of the Achaeans. Thetis herself bade the heroes begin the games. Then Nestor, son of Neleus, rose not to fight for old age had left his limbs stiff and feeble, but to honor the lovely daughter of Nereus with fitting words. He told of her wedding with Peleus, how the gods themselves had attended as guests, how the hours had come with dainty and rich foods and golden baskets, and served them with hands scented with ambrosia. The nymphs had blended the wine in golden bowls while the graces danced, and the Pierides sang. Air and earth, mortals and immortals, all had shared in bliss and delight. This was what Nestor related. And then he went on to tell of the great deeds of the son of Peleus, who had sprung from this union. His words were balm to sorrowful Thetis. And though the Argives were restive and eager to resume the conflict, still, they listened intently and joined in the praise of the hero. Thetis gave Nestor two of her son's horses. Then she selected as a prize for the foot race twelve stately cows, each with a suckling calf. Her son had captured them while he was fighting on the slopes of Ida and brought them back to the camp as spoils. And now Teucer, son of Telamon, and Ajax of Locris, the fleet-footed son of Oleus, stripped to the belt. Agamemnon set up the goal, and they darted forward like two hawks. To the right and to the left them stood the Argives, watching and shouting applauses. Both were close to the goal, and when a tamarisk shrub blocked the path of Teucer, he stumbled and fell. The Danai shrieked with excitement as Ajax of Locris outstripped him, touched the goalpost, and triumphantly led off the cows to his ship. Teucer, his friends, took him to his house, limping. Physicians washed the blood from his foot and carefully bound it. Two other heroes volunteered for the wrestling match, Diomedes and Ajax, the great son of Telamon. Both wrestled with equal strength, but in the end, Ajax locked the son of Tydeus in his sinewy arms and almost throttled him. But Diomedes, who was deft as well as muscular, slipped slantwise out of that terrible grip, straightened his shoulders, lifted his mighty opponent straight into the air so that he was forced to relinquish his hold and with a thrust of his left foot threw him to the ground. The spectators shouted their applause. 
but Ajax pulled himself together and the struggle began afresh. They raged like two bulls who fight in the mountains and butt each other with their heads as hard as iron. This time, Ajax took Diomedes by the shoulders and tossed him to the earth as if he were a rock, and he rolled a little way. Again, a claim rang through the circle, but Diomedes, too, picked himself up and prepared for a third bout. Then Nestor stepped between them and said, Stop wrestling, my children, for there is not one among us who does not know that since the death of Achilles, you are the bravest of the Argives. A cry of approval came from the spectators. The wrestlers wiped the sweat from their foreheads, embraced and kissed each other. Thetis gave them four lovely women who Achilles had captured in Lesbos, each distinguished for her goodness and skill. The first was versed in the arts of cookery. The second tasted the wine at the board. The third poured water at the close of the meals, and the fourth carried the platters from the table. Only Briseis surpassed them in beauty. Each wrestler chose those he wanted and sent them to his ship. Then came the boxing match, for which Idomeneus, the hero, was most skilled in all the intricacies of this form of fighting. He volunteered because of this, and also because he was one of the older men no one offered to compete with him, and so Thetis gave him the chariot of Patroclus as a gift, while Phoenix and Nestor tried to persuade some of the younger men to volunteer for this contest. Apias, son of Panopeus, and Acamas, son of Thesus, were willing to make the attempt. They bound the boxing thongs to their hands and examined them to see if they were flexible. Then they raised their hands, circled each other on their toes, step by step, until suddenly they rushed together like wind-driven clouds, full of thunder and lightning. Through the air rang the smack of the thongs on their cheeks, and blood flowed under the sweat. The thun of Theseus fended off his assailant by craftily dodging his blows, and then, when he was least expecting it, struck him over the eyes with his fist down to the bone, and blood spurted forth. Now Apias hit him in the temple so that he slumped to the ground, but he rose to his feet again, and the match went on until friends interposed and made it clear to these two grim opponents that this was not a matter of Argi fighting Trojan to the death. Thetis gave them both beautiful silver mixing bowls, which her son had received in Lemnos, and the two young heroes reached for them eagerly, not waiting to staunch their wounds. Now, Ajax of Locris and Teucer, who had already measured their strength in the foot race, also competed for the prize of shooting with the bow. As a target, Agamemnon set up a helmet with a fluttering mane, he whose arrow cut the horse hair was to be the victor. Ajax was first. He launched his arrow from the string and hit the helmet so that the metal rang. Then Teucer let his arrow and the point cut the crest. All acclaimed him loudly, for though his foot was still lame from his earlier bout, he had aimed surely and well. Thetis rewarded him with the armor of Troilus, the princely youth of the Trojans who Achilles had slain in one of the first years of the war. The shooting match was followed by throwing the discus. Many of the heroes tried their strength, but no one could throw the heavy disc as far as Ajax, son of Telamon. He tossed it as lightly as though it were a dry branch. Thetis gave him Memnon's armor, and he girt it on at once. The Danai were astonished to see that piece for piece it fitted him as though it had been made to measure. In the jump, Agabinor, brandisher of lances, was victorious, and he received the weapons of Cookness, whom Achilles had defeated. Your Eyeless won in casting the hunting spear, and his prize was a silver bowl Achilles had carried off from Lyrnesius. Next came the chariot races. Five heroes harnessed their horses. Menelaus, son of Atreus, Euryalus, Polypetes, Thos, Eumelus. Then each drove his chariot to the starting post. At a given sign, they swung their goes, and all five at once sped across the plain. The air grew thick with dust and sand. Soon the horses of Emulus outstripped all the rest. After him came Thos and then Menelaus. 
The other two had fallen far behind, but the horses of Thos soon tired. Those of Eumelus stumbled in their swift course, and when their driver wanted to drag them to their feet by force, they reared, threw over the chariot, and he tumbled into the sand. The spectators shouted and screamed, and now the horses of the son of Atreus were far in the lead and halted at the goal. Menelaus exulted in his victory, but he was not arrogant in his joy, and Thetis gave him the golden cup her son had once taken from the palace of Eshan. And here is where I end my tale for today. But I'll be back with more tales, many more tales. Until then, my friends, enjoy the journey.